Drums Digital Transformation Festival and today's session from CX to EX, future proofing the workplace to meet the expectations of today's talent. When we think of experience in the context of business, we often focus on the customer, but we mustn't forget that the employee experience is a vital piece in this puzzle. So how are today's employers closing the loop to deliver richer digital experiences, not just for the customer, but their employees too? I'm Jenny Baker, Assistant Editor at The Drum, and lucky for you, we've assembled a dream team of global CX leaders to explore with us the role of digital transformation in future-proofing the workplace and take a deep dive into how businesses can provide better experiences that meet the expectations of today's marketing talent. So to bring their different perspectives to this conversation, I would like to introduce Manuela Montagnana, Chief People Officer at Critio, Elke Van Tienen, Global Head of People at VML YNR Commerce, Katie Howell, Chief Executive at Immediate Future, and Brendan McCarthy, Chief Marketing Officer at Critio. Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us today. Now we have lots to try and cover, so let's get right to it. So the COVID-19 pandemic changed our personal and professional lives forever. The media landscape and our work environment shifted to 100% digital practically overnight. It's not only changed the expectations of consumers, but what impact has this had on marketing professionals and how has it changed their expectations of the environment that they work in um, from a digital perspective, I guess? Um, Katie, I'd love to come to you first on that. I think it's, it's a super interesting question because it's easy to talk about hybrid working and home working and everything else. But I speak to a lot of CMOs and marketeers um, in the course of my day and I would say there's a there's a deeper fallout um, from COVID and a deeper change happening. And, and, and that's it's lined up to the challenges that we have quite often lower budgets, lack of resource, lack of talent that we have out there, which means that the intensity of working is incredible at the moment. It's people are really, really back to back. Um, even just talking before this, most of us haven't actually actually managed our lunch yet you know and it's in the afternoon and I think that there is a real uh challenge for us as marketeers to actually do good work without racing through the day um and and technology has its part to play in that except we kind of rush towards technology and maybe it's just my view of social media um in that you know we we buy in tools to help us with our social and there's a real challenge with that because nobody gives us any time in between all that intensity to spend any time learning how to use these tools in the first place. <laughs> I'm not sure they help. So there's there's a couple of things that we're beginning to stumble over uh, as we kind of escape the pandemic. Absolutely. And Elke, how about you? I agree. I think it also, the truth is, I think the pandemic humanised business, right? So if anything, over the last two years, it's shown us that the importance of humanity empathy authenticity and purpose you know has really come to life not just in our personal lives but also in in work and we're seeing obviously that consumers and talent are paying more attention to the way that brands and companies show up how they've dealt with the pandemic what their values are how active they are in the community how they're responding to all the world events and they're looking at how their values are really aligning to the brands and and the companies and I think for me, um, a learning about um, the last couple of years is, you know, much like we've had to reimagine the experience of our consumers with a decade's worth of innovation in e-commerce in just a matter of months, we've really had to think about what the employee experience is now for our people. And, you know, as you say, digital transformation plays a, a key role in that. And I think in terms of expectations, what you were saying, what, what the expectations would be is I think, you know, talent are looking for companies to provide them with the tools and technology and Katie, as you say, how, how to use those tools as well, but also to use them to create and play and innovate and just do really great work. 
but also upskilling them against that digital transformation, right? So that learning, so how do they use those tools with confidence? How can they talk about metaverse, social commerce, NFTs? I was saying the other day that I attended a lunch and learn on metaverse, and I think I still got a bit more to learn there. You somehow managed to get metaverse into this conversation. That's pretty good. <laughs> I was talking about it. And um, Brendan, I know you started Critio sort of during the pandemic. So what's your perspective on this? Yeah, my perspective is, um, well, first I'll just say how odd it is whenever you join a company during the pandemic and you have the exact same laptop that you had at your previous company. And on your last day, your previous job, you close the laptop and it's that set of faces. And then a few weeks later, you open it and it's the same laptop, but all new faces. So there's sort of a, a mandate on the brand to be able to make sure that the brand is strong enough that whenever you do open that laptop at a new company, you know, there is awareness because your, your office surrounding hasn't changed, but you got to make sure that you're able to identify and, and buy into a culture of a, of a new company. So, that, I mean, I'd, I'd say that's, that's the experience of starting a job during a pandemic. I'd say um, being a, a leader and, and a colleague through the pandemic, I think we've all learned how to be a little bit more empathetic. Um, checking in on people in ways that we probably never did, genuinely asking how people are doing and looking for a real answer rather than I'm fine, let's you know talk about work. Um, and then given enough time to be able to to hear people out. So I, I think it, it's changed the way that we that we interact with each other and hopefully it's going to make for a, a better place and a more empathetic work environment when we when we get back, you know, more physical, more often in the months to come, God willing. And, and Manuela, you know, where are businesses then making further investments to ensure they're sort of creating the culture and the work environment that employees expect? Um, so to build on what Elke said earlier, I think that what we learned in this um, whole remote setting is that the expectation has shifted, you know, also from an employee perspective, like in the past, people were OK coming to the office like five days a week. That was standard. And some companies were already offering, you know, work from home one or two days a week. And suddenly it's the opposite. Suddenly it's like, okay, we rather want you to be at home and maybe come to the office once or twice. And even if that was possible at some times. So I think it, it forced organizations to really think about how do we connect people, you know, besides the fact that, of course, we all hired hundreds of people virtually, meaning the only interaction is the video screen. So to Brendan's point, how do you bring the culture across, you know? So of course you can send goodies in advance. You can make sure that on top of the laptop, you also have the t-shirt and the cap and the, and the mug, you know, that remind you that you are no longer working for Jim, but now you're working for Joe. Um, but joke aside, I think it's really, um, at Criteo, we really took very seriously this understanding that for a manager, things are shifting very, very much. Like now I have a remote team. Now I have to be so much more empathetic, which people should have been from the very beginning, my personal opinion, right? But I think this was just an, another good reminder. So we had a specific training that we set up in the early days of this whole hybrid work um, for leaders to understand that their leadership expectation is shifting as well when you work in, in an environment where your team is not located at the same place, which, by the way, I would say I'm a global leader. I'm anyway remote to most of my team because I'm not on a daily basis with my um, team in, in APAC or in Europe. But I think it was a good reminder for everybody else that bringing the, um, the culture of an organization closer requires an extra effort. And so we've really doubled down on making sure that we have more communication, that there is a more regular, you know, pulse that is taken with the organization. We are currently reworking our listening strategy. You know, it can no longer be twice a year you ask people how they feel. It has to be something much more closer to that. But we also introduced simple things, speaking about digital, like Headspace, you know, one of these meditation apps that really from a well-being perspective is helping people to decompress and, you know, de-stress. And because we are very aware that we are still in a remote setting where the environment around you matters. We are not only giving a license to each Criteo employee, but also to two 
of their friends or family members, because being in an environment where others are also getting the benefit of that is another way of really focusing on well-being. We have a disconnection policy, you know, that um, is currently reviewed again, where we really try to focus and monitor that it is great to have the flexibility to work whenever you want, but there is also a risk, as we know, that suddenly you work too much and the hours are too long. And so really taking care of these elements and making sure that employees understand, do not want people that are working 24 um, seven, I think is super important. I mean, I can completely agree. I think there's so many things that we needed a refocus on. And as you say, a doubling down on making sure we're looking after the mental health and well-being and shifting a lot of our programs or investment in areas that you know we needed to during the pandemic I think the one constant for us was actually making sure that we continued our investment in diversity equity and, and inclusion I think um, making sure that that wasn't lost in the transition to a hybrid working environment that people felt inclusive and grounded in a sense of culture and obviously diversity enriches culture it makes us better partners to our clients it's essential to driving growth for us we're really lucky we at VML YNR have the commitment of our senior leaders John Cook and Beth Ann Kamniko who are really actively show up in this space and you know we're really proud of a, a lot of the programs that we continued to implement during the the pandemic uh, we have a program called the incubator uh, which is focused on giving open access to our industry to young, diverse talent. And, you know, we were debating on whether we should still do that, uh, being virtual and not be physically together, which is so much about experiencing agency life. But we were very conscious that we didn't want to have this misgeneration of opportunities to understand and gain access to our industry. So we did run it virtually. It was a slightly different experience. And we made sure that technology was available for people. But it was really important for us to continue with those commitments. Our ERG network was really active still during the pandemic, driving education and advocacy. And we showed up in a lot of the work that we did. We did a beautiful piece in partnership with World Women's Foundation for World Women Hour. If you haven't seen it, please go and check out that work. And we continue to invest in the talent. So we hired regional DEI leads. We've promoted somebody internally, Jamie Hill, to Creative Inclusivity Director to really help drive greater inclusivity. And we were really happy last year to get the Drum Diversity and Inclusion Company of the Year last year in recognition of some of that. But I think that continued investment can't stop. That's brilliant. Elka, some great um, initiatives there that you've shared. So Katie, I'll come to you on this next. The desire to, to, to hire marketing talent and good marketing talent with skills is very overwhelming at the moment. In fact, any form of talent and more and more brands are turning to employee branding and the, their kind of outside face for encouraging employees to join them um, and social is one of those channels and oof, there is a real uh, disconnect between what's going on inside an organization and what's going on outside an organization that needs to be tied together and you, you, it was very visible during International Women's Day when uh, the, the pay gap bot um, called out company after company and agency after agency who were claiming to be in support of, of women in the workplace for their pay gap, their gender pay gap. And I think that's a really good example of, of how there's often a disconnect between what we put out in social media to what's actually happening in the business and a lack of understanding that we have to change what's on the inside before we go to the outside because our employees are not daft <laughs> and they, they really aren't um, and more importantly they don't have this weird I'm at work mindset versus I'm at home mindset they have a human being mindset and that human being mindset is fed up at the moment we've been through a pandemic there's all sorts of horrors going on in the world and we don't think it's fair and so when an employee uh, an employer says we're so good at this and they're not, that actually can cause a lot more damage and a lot more risk to the business. And when we want to hire the best of the best, we need to line it up. Well said. Um, and Brendan, what are your thoughts on this? The critical thing for culture moving forward is going to be the workplace. So getting people back into offices in a physical environment, I feel like we've 
done everything that we possibly could do to build culture and build connections in a virtual environment. And um, I think we've probably come to the end of, of all the all the tricks that we have in our hat. So I, I think the the next the next most important thing that we need to do is, is create the right workspaces. Um, I know a lot of companies have recreated their workspaces and Acridia definitely did. Um, we've made our workspaces now a more collaborative space so that they're really geared toward bringing people together versus just where you're going to go in from a, you know, a set time in the morning to a set time in the afternoon. So, in fact, I was talking to a colleague of ours just before this who said she, you know, she, she goes into the office specifically because those are her collaboration days. And the next day she's going to be at home. She's going to do all of her, her virtual calls uh, from home. So it's, um, I think that that's the most important thing we do for culture is get people back together in a workplace that's geared toward the type of environment that's going to help build culture through collaboration. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's where we're going to head next. Yeah, and actually that leads quite nicely to open it up to our other panelists, you know, this, this new world of hybrid working, you know, how are you sort of addressing this? And, and I guess, Elfie, I'll come to you. Yeah, I mean, to Brendan's point, I read a survey, uh, something like 84 percent of employees plan to expand their kind of remote working um, policies and we've seen some companies already put their stake in the ground they've given up all office space they've gone fully remote others moved to a hybrid model we've seen the four day week trial in the news in the UK if you're Mark Zuckerberg you're looking at a workplace in the metaverse I've got metaverse in twice now (laughs) Um, but I think There'll be different approaches globally and and by industry, um, but for us, much like Brendan has said, it's about redefining the purpose of the physical space and reimagining that employee experience. In terms of kind of what that means in terms of the employee experience, for us, um, it's about leveraging our global network and our diverse capabilities to create this new canvas for different types of career paths um, and experiences for our people. And we have a number of initiatives, you know, one that were already existing, but new initiatives to really facilitate this short and long-term internal physical, but also virtual mobility. So you know, one example is a program we have called Creative Hives that allows our talent to work across borders to put their hands up to work on the kind of biggest kind of briefs that we have on our on our clients. So I think it's about creating these new employee experiences. And for us in particular at VML YNR is just leveraging that that global network and capabilities and the breadth of clients that we have. Brendan, how are you managing this um, new sort of way of working with with your own team? That's a great question because it's uh, it's going to be a little bit messy, I think, as we as we transition over the next few weeks. Um, our New York office, where I'm going to be located a few days a week, is is just reopening after construction uh, in, in a few weeks. And the reason why it's going to be messy is because um, I'm not going to enforce that somebody's there on the days that I'm there. I'm going to encourage them to be so, but it it was easier. So it, in many ways, it was easier whenever we went into the pandemic because we knew everybody was going to be at home at the same time. We knew where everybody was, but with the hybrid or flexible working environment, uh, I might have a colleague who's in the office on a Monday, but I'm going to be in on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So being able to line up the the times when they're you know they're going to be in the office versus what my needs are for my own you know personal preferences are going to be a little bit tricky. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to want to be able to, um, to commute in the morning and not do an 8 a.m. call when that person might only be available for an 8 a.m. call, just an example. So we're going to have to work through a few of those things, a few of the little disruptions that were made fairly easy when we went into the pandemic in a twisted kind of way. Um, but it'll be a, maybe it'll be a nice problem that we have. So with just open communication and figuring out, you know, what days you're going to be there and then trying to do our best. Katie, how are you handling this uh, immediate? We've definitely gone to hybrid. Um, we're not all back yet, back three days a week. And um, I'm loving it. Oh, my God, I've forgotten what it's like to have all that energy in one space. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, I really haven't done well being stuck at home, I can tell you. <laughs> and um, But I also think we have to be very cognizant before we give up our offices that, particularly in our industry, in, in marketing agencies, there are an awful lot of youngsters. Uh, you know, I'm allowed to say that because I'm an old lady, but, you know, there's a lot of youngsters in our in, who are in one-bedroom flats who need to get out <laughs> occasionally. Um, but it's also about having some strict guidelines. So we have 
no late working immediate future if people need to go off and pick their friends up from the airport or wherever in the morning nobody cares and so there's not a there's not a strong you must be in but there's a there is a directive that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're in the office. And I think that works kind of quite well. But like Brendan, we are feeling our way through this. We have a couple that have not yet been able to make it back to the office because of uh, risks at home. And that has been a challenge because now we're all together having a giggle and sitting on beanbags and being silly. And the person on the other end of the screen is missing out. And so there's that we're sitting, already beginning to see that we need to wrap around with cultural shifts to make sure that we are inclusive in, in, in everything we do. And I think, you know, we're all going to learn very hard over the next couple of years, I suggest. Definitely. It's, it's an interesting time, isn't it? I think as we all sort of try to figure out how this is going to work. Manuela, speaking more broadly from a, from a critical perspective, you know, how are you handling this sort of globally and what sort of perks and benefits or are you sort of offering that add a bit more meaning to the employee experience? So first of all, to, to build on all that was said, I think flexibility and inclusion are the two things that are really key here. We have had an internal survey where our employees told us that 27% want to stay full remote. So we were heading towards a hybrid um, offer where people would come in maybe two days a week. We're currently rethinking this now with regards to is full flexibility maybe where we need to go. But as Brendan also said, we invested in our workspaces. We took actually the opportunity of being shut down to actually redo a lot of things. So now the question really is, why would people come to the office? They're not coming for a desk and a chair because of course that's part of the benefits that we provide, right? Everybody got a great work from home equipment budget. We made sure that everybody has, you know, what they need in terms of tools to be well equipped at home, but they want to come to the office because there is something else there. And this is where the whole community um, discussion comes up, the inclusion discussion as well. How are we going to manage Going further, the example that Katie gave, I think, is a great one. You know, you have four people in one meeting room and two people on the screen. How do you make sure that the experience for the two people on the screen is not awful? Now, people will say before that it was like that. Yeah, but you know what? We had democratic access to everybody. You know, everybody was just a Zoom call away from the CEO or from every, anybody else on the senior leadership team. Now, how do we perpetrate a culture of making sure everybody feels included and people don't feel like, oh, because I'm based somewhere else and I might not be able to come on a daily basis in, this is really going to, to, to change things. But to come back on your specific questions with regards to the, to, to the benefits, um, so there is indeed like the basic things that I believe everybody else did, like equipping people, making sure that they have um, the opportunity to work in an environment that is really, really good. I, I told you about um, the headspace um, example, you know, of something that is a little thing. Um, but there's also things that are linked to the development. Like last year, we had 800 employees who changed roles. That was either internal mobility towards another job. It was promotions. We have a very active global mobility program as well. So we are leveraging the fact that Criteo has 29 locations across the globe. And when there is people who actually express an interest for relocating permanently to another country, we see if we can support that. And back to Katie's earlier point about the makeup of our organization, of course, it's easier when you're 27 years old and you do not have yet a family and children and all the problems of dual career considerations with your spouse. So offering at different stages in your career, almost a tailored answer to what your development aspirations might be, we believe is something that is going to really help us continue to attract and retain talent, which again, on the long run is what we are all now striving for. So really offering these development opportunities um, in the organization, I believe is something that is not necessarily a monetary benefit immediately, but it is something that is building a career, is building you know, an experience and in some cases, a new life 
um, which is also super important. As we wrap this up, you know, I'm going to throw, it's a bit of a two-part question, I guess, you know, what advice would you give now to a marketing professional looking to make their next move? And also, I guess, you know, how can you spot an employer that has its eye on the future? Um, Katie. Okay, so I'd say I'm going to start with the second question, which is an employer that's got its eye on the future is now training its leaders, is actually investing in its leadership team so that their management know how to deal with this changing, evolving world and how to talk to staff and not create a toxic culture. And on the second question, if I was looking for a job, I could tell you exactly what I'd want. <laughs> I'm not looking for a job at the moment, but if I was, <laughs> I'm all for accountability. I'm not frightened about accountability. What I, frustrates me and what I think we want most of is, and the bit that's missing is getting the, the bit between our teeth with our jobs. There is nothing quite the same as the job where you can effect change, where you can make a difference, where your what you do has impact not on, only on your colleagues, not only on the business, but also your family, your home life, everything. And that bit of empowerment is the thing we need to get back. The pride in what we do as marketeers. If we, if I was looking for a job, I would say, fine, don't mind about targets, but if you're going to strangle me by telling me what my marketing should look like or what the, our logo needs to be and everything, I don't want this job. I want a job where I've got freedom. Well said. And actually, Brendan, I'd love to actually go to you next because you've obviously had this great opportunity. You launched a Super Bowl ad um, this year. So yeah, so what? how would you answer that? What advice would, would you give? I would look, I mean, I think it comes down to a lot of things that we've discussed here, which is I, I would look at an employer who's um, who's got the kind of flexibility that you expect in your next job, because these are, you know, our expectations throughout the pandemic have been reset. And, um, you know, our, our personal lives previously took sort of a backseat to, to what re was required from a specific schedule at work. And I think that there's enough great employers out there, you included, uh, that have the type of flexibility that you will need uh, in order to do whatever you want to do um, to meet your personal needs, whether that's, you know, get your kids ready for school in a particular morning or what I do on Thursday nights during the winter is I take my son snowboarding. Uh, so I, I want to be able to do that on, on Thursdays. And I expect that people are also going to look for that kind of flexibility in their lives, knowing that at the end of the day, you're working somewhere that's going to meet your values. That's a culture that you want to be in and has the kind of flexibility that's going to meet your life. Because, you know, the, the talent has a lot of leverage out there where we are today. And, and we've got to do more to be able to, to bring the people in uh, who have different expectations of what a work environment is going to look like in the future. Well said. Um, and Elke, what's your closing advice? Well, I completely agree with what Brendan and Katie have said. And to build on Brendan's um, last comment, I think with uncertainty and disruption comes opportunity. I think with the great resignation or the talent reshuffle, um, as someone has said, companies are pivoting to adjust to new skill sets that they require. And there's a lot of movement going on in the market and companies are competing for the best talent. So I think we're operating at an exciting time for marketing professionals looking to make their next career move. And in terms of your question about you know, advice, I think mine would be twofold. The first would be learn, ask a lot of questions, be curious about the digital transformation that we're seeing, immerse yourself in it. And the second would be understanding what your superpower is, figure out what makes you unique, what you're really passionate about and lean into it. Great advice. And Manuela, final word from you. What else can I say? Elke is such a great speaker in terms of, you know, you should, you should consider a career in the people world. You know? <laughs> No, I think that I, I I totally subscribe to all of that. I think that, you know, we are all competing for the same talent and we are all paying them the same. We are all offering basically the same things. But what makes a difference is what is the purpose? What are you, what do you want to achieve? You know, do you feel like there is a fit with the values that a company is um, bringing forward? I was listening to Katie, you know, Criteo is open together and impactful. You know, like this is exactly what we're putting forward is that we want people that don't wait for somebody to tell them what they should be doing, but we want them to take the lead and to do this in a very inclusive environment. And, 
you have to feel comfortable with that, you know, you, you, because with accountability and ownership and empowerment comes also the responsibility then to do things. So um, I think most of the candidates today are still doing virtual interview processes. So it's challenging because you do not have the handshake and the chemistry um, that you see. But so do research, you know, look at, there is great digital tools like, you know, Glassdoor and others, you know, that help candidates today better understand where they're actually going towards. So don't be shy, ask questions, but also do your research part with regards to, is there a good connection between what the company says that they're putting forward and the reality of what people are actually then thinking. Well said. I think that that was always going to be a bit of a tall order trying to squeeze all that into under 30 minutes, but I think we just about managed it. But look, thank you so much, Katie, Manuela, Elkie, Brendan, um, for that super insightful session. I think, you know, there was lots to kind of recap on there, but I think certainly culture, alignment of values, flexibility, inclusion, empathy, you know, going back to what Brenda said at the very start. But yeah, so I've got lots of uh, great notes there. Thanks to everyone who tuned in to watch. Make sure to join the conversation via hashtag DTFest22 and head over to the Drums Digital Transformation Festival website for more content. Thanks again, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.